I would like to give a warm welcome to everyone uh, who is attending today's webinar. We are very excited to be co-hosting uh, this webinar today between RHEL Northeastern Islands and RHEL West. We have an exciting agenda and great speakers today. And uh, you'll see that we've set up the webinar with two opportunities for questions. Uh, as you're listening, uh, please type all the questions you have in the, in the chat bar. We'll be monitoring that chat box um, and, uh, to co and collecting those questions to have available during the Q&A period. And we'll then read those questions out so that the presenters can, can answer them. We may yeah. not get to every single question today, but please be sure to ask them. We are collecting them all, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. I just want to take a, a brief moment um, to acknowledge that this webinar is being co-hosted by the Regional Education Laboratory Northeastern Islands together with REL West. Uh, we are co-hosting this webinar as part of our work with the Cross-REL English Learners Working Group, which meets together to move forward research on English learners across the United States. In conversations with that group, this topic of the links between pre-kindergarten and kindergarten and K-5 to um, emerged as an important one. And we are thrilled that so many people agreed with us um, and registered for this webinar. Um, and I'm now going to turn the webinar over to my co-facilitator, Elizabeth Burr from Well Rel West, who will introduce our speakers for the day. Elizabeth? Thanks, Carrie. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Burr. and um, I will, before I introduce our dynamic speakers, I'm just going to briefly go over the goals for today. Our presenters will be sharing information on uh, effective language models for dual language learners in preschool and also discuss alignment issues between pre-K and K-3. And it's our hope that you'll come away with specific strategies that you can take back with you in your work. So you've already heard from Carrie and from me. I do want to introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, we have, we're thrilled to have such engage, engaging speakers with us today, including Linda Espinosa, who is Professor Emeritus and an expert in language learning in early childhood. And we also have with us Whit Hayslip, the former super, Assistant Superintendent of Early Childhood Education at Los Angeles Unified School District. And not only are they both deeply knowledgeable about these topics, but their passion and enthusiasm are really contagious, and you are about to see that in action. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Linda. Thank you, and, and hello all. Thank you to the REL staff for giving us this opportunity to, to discuss the development and the supports important for the success of dual language learners. So part one, which is the part that I'm responsible for, focuses on the topic of understanding acquisition of a second language during early childhood and what those, those um, developmental findings, what the implications then are for our practices. The first thing that we need to, to think about is who exactly are dual language learners? Um, because it's a terminology that we use in early childhood, not so much in K-12, and it's a relatively new term that acknowledges um, the fact that these children are learning both two languages as well as learning about the world through two different languages. And that process, just the fact that they are systematically exposed to more than one language, in fact, does change the architecture of their brain and the ways in which they process language. And that's kind of a permanent feature of their language learning. So it, it is a, a feature of dual language learners that is different from, no, from monolingual learners that we need to be aware of as we dis, dif, design effective um, approaches to their education. And dual language learners can be either simultaneous or sequential. So simultaneous dual language learners would be those children who have two languages from the very first days, weeks, months of their lives. We sometimes call, call them um, crib bilinguals. Um, and their language and neural development around language processing actually looks different 
in those children who are exposed to a second language after about three years of age, and we call them sequential second language learners. Um, the other thing that's important to know about simultaneous dual language learners is they tend to be very high achievers, and it's a fairly small group. So there aren't a lot of children that have been intentionally equally exposed to two languages from birth, but they're an extraordinary and academically um, high achievers. The term that we use in K-12 most often that many, that many people are familiar with is English learner or English language learner. Sometimes in school districts, they will also refer to their pre-K or state pre-K children as English learner. Um, now, another difference between, between K-12 and early childhood is that at K-12, there must be a consistent statewide process for identifying who is a dual language learner. Um, some states have this um, well worked out system of identification for dual language learners in the pre-K arena like Illinois does. Um, and it, it's a very systematic process that programs must comply with. Most states, most districts, most programs do not have a systematic process for identifying. Therefore, if you look at state records or state pre-K records, many of which don't even tell you how many um, dual language learners there are, um, you, it's difficult to compare across programs across states because we're not using the same definitions. And that's one of our goals, which would be a, a systematic and consistent approach to identifying who is a dual language learner during the early childhood years. So for this population of children, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, we do experience a sense of demographic urgency. Certainly in the time that I've been working in this field, which is, oh, I won't say exactly, but it's over 30 years, um, we, I have seen the rapid um, rise in both the diversity of the children who are non-native English speakers, the numbers of different languages that are spoken in the home and arriving into our programs, as well as the size or the proportion of children in our programs that speak languages other than um, English in the home. And just a few statistics to reinforce that point. We could present dozens more, but, but these, I think, capture nationally what we're seeing um, that you're probably um, witnessing in your own communities and your own neighborhoods, that more than 30% of children enrolled in Head Start live in households where English is not the primary language. And for a while there, that was going up 2 3% a year. It seems to be stabilizing at about 30% or a third. Within Head Start, more than 140 different languages are spoken. Across the country, we actually have about 350 different languages. So that, that, that um, figure of 140 languages varies as well as, we, as different communities um, grow in their Head Start capacity. The other indication that it's growing in size is that it has increased from 11% of students in 1980 to almost 25% of all students in pre-K through 12 in 2017. So from 11, so it's more than doubled. And in some states, particularly in the southeastern states, that growth has been enormous. Um, I would say the southeastern states and the midwestern states in particular have seen enormous growth, where states like California and Texas and Florida have always had relatively high proportions and has continued to be high. So 27% of all children in the U.S. Were, are born in dual language homes. Think of that, 27%. And most of them speak Spanish. But again, that which is the native language other than English, I think, varies widely by community. So it's hard to generalize across the country. Um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about what does the recent science tell us about the best approaches to early bilingualism and long-term school success for dual language learners. And luckily, as I said, I've been working in this field for about 30 years, and we now have a report titled Promoting the Educational Success of Children and Youth Learning English, Promising Futures Because They're Getting Ready to Take Off, published by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. It was published um, in the spring of 2017. This is a committee that um, was comprised of 17 members, everything from a, a sociologist to a cognitive neuroscientist. And 
I was privileged and honored to be a part of that committee to both learn from experts in different fields, but also to contribute um, the perspective an early, of an early childhood educator. The topics that we addressed in this research, and this is really rather novel because I'm not aware of other um, academies' reports that have had as, as wide a scope and as large a task as this particular committee. But what, what we were, were examining were studies that provided evidence on, of best practices for dual language learners. So this report covered birth to age 21, so children, adolescents, pre-K, through grade 12 and college preparedness. Um, we had um, a focus on early language development from birth to five. And for those of you that are birth to five and want to follow up, um, we will send you a link where you can download the, the report. And chapters four and five in particular are relevant for those of you working in the birth to five arena. However, like I said, there are chapters on everything from reclassification to, to um, you know, successful high school completion. Um, so the development of English language proficiency in K-12. Um, chapters 6, 7, and 8 talk about school organizational and classroom factors that support educational success. And again, it's a com compilation of the research studies that we could find, both empirical and qualitative research studies, and pulling them all together to find some common um, threads from birth to 21, which is an interesting finding. Because going on to this committee, I did not know how similar the conclusions and the findings and the recommendations about language acquisition and successful educational approaches were from birth to 5 and K to 12. So we have a, the, the research, I think, is pretty clear about, about how this develops and what are some of the most effective supports to help dual language learners achieve the potential that they are capable of. It was an extremely important finding for me, and I hope for everybody else who attends to this, um, this report. We also have a chapter on specific populations, so children with disabilities, gifted and talented, homeless, migrant, and indigenous heritage language learners. Um, again, with some rather novel findings that I hope you, you um, are um, able to um, reference later. A whole chapter on assessment, which is extremely important for dual language learners, and then a chapter on workforce. What are the workforce competencies for people working in, with dual language learners pre-K through grade 12? I'll quickly go through this strong, what do we have strong evidence for? So, and some of this is new, some of this reinforces and I'm, I'm thankful this report reinforces practices and principles that we have been recommending for you know, over 10 years, I would say. But, but a main finding across the board is that all infants, toddlers, preschoolers have the capacity to learn more than one language. And when we say capacity, we, and all infants, we do mean even infants and toddlers, children who have been identified with special needs, children who have language impairments, who have been later are identified um, as having autism, that, that all of them are capable of becoming successfully bilingual and benefit from it. And that this balanced bilingualism, so relatively comparable skills in both languages, carry significant social, linguistic, cognitive, and cultural benefits. So we have children, all, all children, but really dual language learners in particular, that have this potential to become gifted in certain areas because they start out with um, the potential for um, a balanced bilingualism. So those with more balanced bilingual skills showed greatest advantages. So if you have just a tiny little bit of one language, like many, many people do, that's not going to result in the types of cognitive advantages, particularly in the area of executive functioning and um, metalinguistic skills, that, that children are more skilled in both languages. The third point, beginning bilingual exposure before three years of age leads to best proficiency in English long term. Relatively new finding that age of exposure is a, a strong predictor of eventual long term proficiency in English, which also presents a conundrum to the field. And we know this because of the lab um, studies that have been done on babies and neurocognitive consequences of exposure to more than one language. 
So children are capable of, of learning two languages. They're capable of becoming proficient in two languages. And if you start earlier, long-term advantages in the second language seem to be um, higher. Um, and I'll return back to this point as well, because it, it, um, it does suggest some um, components of designing um, programs that we need to also um, weigh the evidence around other factors than language that, that um, influence long-term school success. So anyway, number four, children need language exposure from competent speakers of that language, importance of good language role models. This is particularly important when we um, talk with parents who want to very quickly shift to English and speak only English in the home when they're not proficient in English. What it does long term is um, delay the competent development of the child's native language and does very little to really um, promote um, proficient language um, proficiency in, in the English language long term. So competent speakers, and in our programs, the same rule applies. If you're the language model, the English language model, if you're the Spanish language model, if you're the Persian language model, we need to make sure that these are good language models so children are learning grammatical structures that are correct and, and in vocabulary and pronunciation, et cetera. Strong evidence for, again, this is no different, point five is no different than what we know about all children that language interactions need to be frequent, responsive to child's interests. Um, so we, we pick up on what they're interested in. As much as we introduce novel, novel concepts, we really pay attention to children and expand on their interests, and then they will be engaged and attentive, and the content will stick. So that the language is, is expanded and varied to promote oral language development. And what this means is that we're paying attention, we're responding to the child's cues, and then we're building on it and adding adjectives and adding adverbs and complex sentence structure, even for one-year-olds, you know, that we, that we are not just raining words on babies, we're in fact responding to what they're looking at and helping to label it and describe it and show them pictures of it, whatever. But all of that develops that very important oral language um, a basis for later literacy skills. And that, that seems to be a huge neglected area of, of second language acquisition. Point, point six being exactly that, the oral language skills need to be emphasized from day one. Um, also, stronger home language and English skills at kindergarten entry predicted best school outcomes. So if we had our, our ideal situation, Children would be equally exposed to both languages, and they would that would which would result in strong skills in both English and in Spanish, which then predicts high reading skills in both languages at third grade and staying in school and exceeding in many subject areas long term. So that's that's kind of a um, an underlying um, finding that we need to keep in mind. However, point eight is the caveat because it's never simple. <laughs> that the home language must be explicitly and systematically supported, or it will decline once DLLs are exposed to English, whether they're exposed to three or three to five, if they come into a program speaking only one language, and that's their first exposure to English. What you frequently see is this um, desire to shift to English. So as educators, we have to work with families to continue to stress the importance of home language and then also attending to it in our programs, which we can do, and we'll show examples of that. So specific instructional approaches and strategies, and we're, we're going to present some of those today to um, promote English comprehension. Uh, point 10 about frequent assessment formative is essential to program effectiveness. Now, we, we all know that from a, an instructional and early childhood point of view. We have to know how children are pro progressing. The additional feature for those of us that work with dual language learners is that we need to have some um, benchmark about how they are progressing in their home language as well as English. This is a complicated topic. There are methods and procedures, even though we don't have tools for all languages, but we do have methods and procedures, and we can send follow-up information with more explicit guidance on exactly how you do that when you have a low-incidence language and a child that you may be concerned about. 
point eleven families need to be involved in the education of dual language learners. If there's one thing we've always known in early childhood, families are critical partners, and for dual language learners, we cannot do it alone. Families are the key factor in helping to maintain L1 or the child's native language. Um, the report also addresses what are the teacher competencies and the specific training requirements um, in order to be effective with dual language learners. So to bring it all down to a nutshell, the basic principle of best practices for ECE for DLLs, early proficiency in both children's home languages and English at kindergarten entry is critical to becoming academically proficient in a second language. Use of consistent approaches from pre-K to grade three, that's the other thing, so that whatever language models and whatever supports we've enacted during those pre-K years get continued into the K-3 years, and that will support the ongoing um, academic um, achievement um, of, D of DLLs. So systematic exposure to English and ongoing support of a child's home language. And how do we do that? <laughs> how do we do that when we have multiple languages and within our field we still have predominantly monolingual English-speaking teachers? So the challenge is d developing the methodology to accomplish the goals that we know are in their best interest. So an example of how one large multilingual school district in California has embraced this new research and is implementing a planned approach to effective early education for all students birth to grade three with a focus on dual language learners is the Fresno Unified School District Language Project that Witt is going to describe. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you, Linda. And I, I need to say right off that I have had the good fortune of working with Linda for a number of years. When I was at the Los Angeles Unified School District, she helped us in the design of programs. And in the last few years, she's been helping us with this project I'm going to talk a little bit about, which is called the Fresno Language Project. <clears throat> Some of you may not know that Fresno is one of the poorest and neediest communities in the country. It's in the Central Valley of California and was very affected by some of the economic downfalls. And so it also is an area that has a high percentage of dual language learners. So that this project has really seen its focus as improving professional development and training for early educators to better support the needs of young dual language learners. A lot of our recent research in early childhood has focused on the interaction between adults and children, both in terms of professionals and parents. And so this project has really said, how are we going to improve those interactions in terms of support of dual language learners? That um, I, and a couple of points about this project that as a former 38-year um, member of a school district has been unique is that even though it was the school district that initially instigated this program, it was a very different approach than one I've ever used. Frequently, I know in K-12 systems that when we reach out to the birth to five community, we're using the, the frame of readiness. And frequently, that frame means how are you getting the kids ready for us? And so that there's sort of a hierarchical approach. That here's what we need, and here's what we expect of you. This project has been cross cross-discipline and cross-agency, working both with the school district, but with the birth to five agencies in the community. So it's worked with Head Start, it's worked with community preschoolers, and it's worked with family child care providers. And what's been interesting about this, it has taken the lens of we all need to learn. This is not one of the areas where we can say, get them ready for us because we know how to do it. School districts, Head Start, Community preschools are all struggling with how we do this. So we started off with a level playing field of need. And so that's been very exciting to us, that we came together. We had some funding that was from a foundation. And so that we've had, um, we've had five, we have five three-hour Saturday professional development sessions. And we have able to be hire a coach who focuses on these strategies. And in the training, we focused on, on these four elements. The first is the value of linguistic and cultural diversity. And Linda helped us tremendously with this. A lot of it has to do with attitudes. And so that we really did have to work with folks and seeing it not as a hurdle or a barrier, but as a door and a window. And so that we really worked a lot on helping people understand the value of linguistic and cultural diversity. Also, the importance of family engagement. We realized, first of all, that like Linda said, we have many monolingual English 
speaking teachers, so that if we're going to do this, it has to be a joint process with families. So the value of this, the actual strategies of it have to be shared with families. You're going to learn about some specific strategies that Linda and some other of her colleagues developed called personalized oral language learning. We're going to talk about that further in our, in our webinar. And then the ongoing support for home language, both within the, the classroom or the set or the home child care and within the child's home as well. It, we are now in our third year. We're learning tremendous things. I have good news and the state of California has just funded us to replicate this statewide. And so I hope we'll be able to share some of that in the future with you. Okay, Linda? Hey, ready. The, the other thing that I think was unique about the Fresno Language Project and, um, was the interagency collaboration. Right. It, Whit mentioned the equality of the playing field. I mean, we can all talk about it, but it really is hard to achieve to get everybody to the table. Infants and toddlers, private child care providers, community-based, um, for-profit providers, state, the school district providers, et cetera. And that planning process that everybody went through to agree to goals and agree to an approach and a focus on dual language learners, which, it, which also helped other children from um, low-income homes. So it's, it's, it's really been quite a, a pleasure to work with a district that has been so careful about its approach and so um, inclusive of all of the agencies um, um, represented um, being able to, uh, to focus on similar goals. So anyway, that's, right. that's been a huge... And Linda, one one more thing, which you mentioned just now, it, it has been birth on up to school age. And so the fact we talk about this continuum continuity of learning, it's been very exciting for the professionals that are involved to really see how this language develops across that age span. Really wonderful. And family child care, which typically doesn't get included in some of the professional development. They've been at every session and have been right. a part of the program. So so it's been, it's been I think, um, a really great example of how a large district can, like I said, embrace this and implement it at high levels. So, so what's it based on? What, what is the approach that, we, that the district decided to take? And it was this personalized oral language learning, or POL, as we called it, that I and Carola Oliva Olson and Elizabeth McGruder, we originally decided on the main components when we were designing the Los Angeles Unified School District Transitional Kindergarten because most of the uh, classrooms in the original cohort had had multitudes of dual language learners. And if you'll remember, at that time, California was under a restriction for that um, constrained teachers about how much support could be provided for dual language learners. So this program was designed to really address the needs where you don't either have the capacity or the regulatory um, agreement to support full out dual language programs. If you have full out dual language programs, you know, you're already achieving many of the goals that we've set forth in a systematic way. But where you have um, school districts or communities that have multiple languages and limited capacity to offer dual language programs. What we designed was an approach, this poll oral language learning program that would assist all teachers, all early childhood teachers, monolingual um, English speaking teachers, dual language teachers, whoever, to support home language. Because remember, that's the caveat once you introduce English. So what are some specific strategies that all teachers can use? And we start with the family languages and interest survey. Um, and, and we have a specific set of environmental support. But again, it's modified based upon the classroom teacher's um, resources and interests and, and directions that, that each teacher goes in. Um, and then we have specific instructional supports, which, which we'll talk about. It, it, I mean, in my experience with this district, you know, after having worked with dozens of districts across the country, the, the, um, the finding that teachers become extremely creative and resourceful. You know, once the basic principles are in place and understood, teachers start developing um, instructional lessons that we never thought of that apply the principles that we then, the, that we then provide them with. So, um, 
So I really believe in the creative capacity of programs to go beyond what we teach them. So in that sense, it's not a prescribed program where we tell every teacher, you must do this unit on the second week of classrooms, and this is how you do it, and here are the extension activities. No, that's not, it, that's not the approach that we've taken on with this program. Um, so the first feature is the family languages and interest interview. And that's really more of a structured process to get to know families. So ideally, it takes place at the very at early on during the school year. Um, it is based upon the teachers and the staff deeply held belief in the um, knowledge and the respect of the families, so that we truly believe that they will help educate us about their child, about when their child was exposed to English, about their, the child's favorite hobbies. That this initial exchange um, allows us to tap into the expertise of the parent and the family about a child, help us gain some insights in the things that we will see in the program. And in early childhood, you know, particularly for, children, for families that are not native English speakers and may have cultural traditions that we're not aware of, that mutual respect and trust in those early conversations kind of sets the tone for everything that's going to happen later, later throughout the school year. So we set up that rapport with families, we communicate respect, we listen, we really want to know about their child, and in my experience, there's no parent that doesn't want to tell you about their child. I mean, this is, this is their opportunity to um, help their child um, shine in the lights of the school. And I think it's extremely important for us to give them that chance. We developed a family language as an interest interview that gets at some of that information. It's not the only one available. Head Start has one. Other programs have one. We just decided on this particular format that we used in LAUSD. I think we've even changed it for Fresno. But a study that we did in, in um, Chicago using this particular um, instrument revealed that whoever the primary caregiver of the child and whatever language that person speaks tends to predict that child's proficiency in whatever language that is. So if the primary caregiver speaks Spanish, that child should be high in Spanish, or English, that child should be high in English. If the grandparents are speaking to the child in another language, and they're the ones that spend the most time with the child, that's where you should see the higher language scores or the language dominance of the child. The other family members, such as siblings and whatnot, had a mild, much milder contribution to that child's overall language experience. But again, this is a format. It's a structure that helps the teacher sit down and go through a process where you learn about the child, and you can also, at that time, engage the family in um, school-related activities, either as volunteers or helping you set up classrooms. Um, so you, you, at that point, establish that partnership because you will both be working together on the same types of, of language development. And it can be in the classroom. It can be in the home. It can be in a variety of settings. But you hopefully get that bond with the family to operate together on behalf of the child. Um, so in, in our mind, in family engagement is a process, not an event. That we begin that process with that conversation. We open our minds. We learn from and we appreciate what that family um, is able to tell us. Um, and that starts from the first moment, how you agree, how you meet um, a family. And, and how you uh, respond to the fact that you may not speak their languages. And there are tons of ways that, that families can continue to be involved in the program, from volunteering to having family support groups to reading in the home. I mean, we've got multiple um, resources that outline a variety of, of specific activities that families and schools can engage in. The second part, or the third part of poll, has to do with specific types of instructional supports. And one of those supports is an interactive or dialogic reading experiences with dual language learners. 
as all of you know, they're involved in literacy. That dialogic or interactive um, book reading experience with children seems to be an, a very powerful way to promote um, early literacy skills. So especially in the area of oral language, um, that child's ability to listen, to comprehend, and to learn no, new vocabulary. There are some adaptations for, for dual language learners that I'll mention in a minute, one of which is to pre-read in the home language so that somebody can go through the book with that child in the home language so the child will learn the main um, characters, the main vocabulary, the narrative of the story um, in the language they understand, and they can apply that then to that story in English and reread that book multiple times. So what are some of the adaptations that we might implement for dual language learners? One of the things that our um, TK teacher um, experienced um, very early on, and I think everyone who's worked with small groups or large groups of young children, you realize when you've got a large group, it doesn't always give everyone the opportunity to talk. So when you can do small groups, three to four students, and every child has the opportunity to tell you something, um, that that's really important for um, every child's development in oral language abilities. We essentially want them to start, get them going, help them talk, you know, having them communicate and express themselves in whatever language is what's going to, to facilitate that oral language ability. And using the pictures in the books to encourage labeling, we can do what they can do, we can do it together discussing personal connections, and you'll see that illustrated um, in our video, where you connect what is happening in the book to what that child has personally experienced within the family. Those kinds of things are gold for um, child attention, child engagement, child enthusiasm. Eventually, the, you, the child will be retelling you the stories, and they may even adapt it to their particular home um, situation, and that's great then they start telling you all, ab all about you know, the things that they um, like to do, the people they talk to, what they're interested in. And they become the storytellers to you. Um, all of children's language attempts in any language are encouraged and praised. So even if they're not speaking the target language that you're trying to um, uh, use for that lesson, for that storybook reading, it doesn't mean you in any way um, indicate that they have been, um, in, that they're incorrect. And you'll see an example of that in the videotape. Um, so that teachers comment on ex and expand on children's responses. Again, that's engaging that interest. It's paying attention to what they're saying and building upon it and kind of um, organizing it around what that targeted vocabulary is for that particular lesson. So we have an example now of a mom engaging in interactive dialogic reading with two primary Spanish-speaking students who are in a classroom with a monolingual English-speaking teacher. And so pay attention to how she used the target language, in this case is Spanish. She's reading the book to children in Spanish. Pay attention how she uses um, English and Spanish during this um, dialogic reading um, experience. And again, this is a mom, um, not the teacher. It's developing language is developing language. We want it in children's home language as well. Van a ir volando a las casas, van a ir a visitar. Se van de visita a los patitos. Bueno, vamos a ver qué va a pasar en la historia de los cinco patitos. Que se fue a la finca, entró a la casa y cerró la puerta. Sí, está. Sí. Y mientras tanto, mamá pata, ¿qué hacía? Limpiando, ah, no, limpiando este. Planchando. Sí, I was going to say that. I <laughs> Pero I ¿sabes cómo decirlo? Planchando. Sí. ¿Planchando qué? Mi, una la ropa. ropa. La ropa. Y mi grandma, oh, mi grandma plancha. ¿Tu abuelita plancha? Qué lindo. También, también mi mami. ¿Tu mami también plancha? ¿Cómo está mi grandma 
a México. Okay. Um, it has run through on my... Okay, great. So we're back to the slides. So if you'll see, that mom was... Um, inter she was reading the book and talking about the story in Spanish, but you saw the little guy um, speak to her in English. And she didn't deviate or move away from the target language of the um, telling of the story. She reinforced what the child had to say. And if you watched her carefully, they had a very nice emotional connection. They both kind of laughed at what he said. You know, they appreciated. And, and the mom went on continuing to tell the story in Spanish. So it, it's a wonderful example, I think, of, of you know, a couple of things. One, moms can help you do this. And, and it's very important for children to hear that um, storybook reading in their first language and have the opportunity to practice it. But it's also an example how a child, and, and I've been in many classrooms where children lead teachers on what language they want to speak. They might want to go into English um, because they know enough to communicate, but they really need to have extended practice in their first language. And that's up to the teacher to really manage that process of which language is going to be used when um, for which purposes. And I thought she did that in a really seamless, beautiful way and was able to also bring in the child's experiences around his grandma, you know, by ironing and cleaning the clothes and that his, he remembers his grandma did, which again is that connection to the story with the child's personal life. And sometimes that can only happen in the child's first language. Linda, can, yeah. um, that t the teacher Barbara here in this case is a monolingual English speaker. And so this was a parent volunteer who was bilingual. And so one of the important things is that the teacher, the monolingual English speaker, had worked with that mom and done some work on dialogic reading. So it wasn't that she just threw the mom into that corner and said, start reading, but she had actually helped the mom understand dialogic reading. So she was able, with this parent engagement, and she had a great relationship with this mom, to give the mom some specific strategies. So she wasn't deserting the mom to this activity, but preparing her for it. And you know, that's an important point. Although I think this mom was very talented on her own, I, you really can't just throw parents in. You have to um, have some method of training them to the approaches you're using and support them while they're, they're learning them because some of it might not be um, a natural, intuitive way that parents would interact with language and their children and concepts. It's a very important point that you wouldn't just use them. But they, like this mom who was available, very talented and capable of understanding um, the principle and then implementing it in a very high level way, I thought, with those two children. So, um, so okay, another, some of the other aspects of uh, poll, personal oral language learning, to increase comprehension and vocabulary development for dual language learners. One thing that we talk about is the anchor text. We'll talk about these things more later. But that, that text does provide, you know, throughout the week, throughout the, the um, lesson, the topic of the week, the theme of the what it, how, whatever you call it, that that text provides the content, usually, you know, the academic content and the vocabulary that you're going to read throughout the week with the children. So you have, how you select the anchor text is very important. And then the, the second point on that is that the intent that teachers use every day an intentional message. The one that's described there as today mathematicians, we will compare numbers 1 to 10. So you have that intentional message, hopefully in both languages, and that tells the children, helps them to focus on today, this is what, you know, we're, what our um, time in this classroom, as, as we attend to the teacher, that's going to be the point of the lesson. So they know right away how to focus their attention. Um, the next point around songs and chants, um, it's interesting because for a long time we had believed in the power of melody and rhythm and songs to be able to imprint knowledge or words and concepts for children. And recent research has actually confirmed that, um, that power of using songs to help children learn words. And with going to talk about songs and chants and give you an example and how those can be used to promote 
um, academic development and vocabulary enhancement um, as you attach those songs to the um, theme or the topic of the lesson. And then, of course, all of us who work with, with dual language learners know the importance of using gestures or visual cues. In the older grades, they often refer to it as total, total physical response. But that you get, even all early childhood educators, I would have to say, get involved in using their bodies so that big, you, you can actually show them the concept concretely and literally. You have pictures, you have sizes, you have objects, you have all kinds of things that help them connect that language to an actual, um, um, either an object or a concept in the room that has more than one representation. It helps to reduce the abstractness of the language and the ways we use it. Um, so in these next um, video interactions that you're going to have a chance to look at, you will look for opportunities for responsive interactions. So across the day, not just during literacy activities or during small groups, center time, and one-on-one -on -one interactions. One of the things that was found about 20 years ago was that when children and teachers and this was in the early childhood realm with highly qualified teachers. But when children and teachers did not share a language, that teachers tended not to talk to the children, smile at the children, touch them, or encourage them to be a part of the conversation. So in some respects, children who had um, a language that was not either the language of the classroom or the language that the teacher understood they could be easily become isolated. Um, Pat and Tabor had a word for it. I think it was, um, oh, I don't remember right now. But the outliers, they could easily feel excluded from the activities of the classroom, which is, again, going to reduce the number of times that they can have these high-level language interactions, one-on-one -on -one or in small group or whatever. So you want to make sure that you don't exclude a child or not address the language um, of the child because you don't speak it. And there are ways that that can, can be achieved. In the first example that we're going to see, there's this wonderful Moises, and he is a bilingual resource teacher, Spanish-English, in a um, pre-K program from um, teaching at the beginning. And you'll get a link to that series of videos as well. This is just one of them. But it's an Hi, Lin Linda, can I just break in? Oh, this is Carrie. Just before we begin, uh, we've been hearing that a number of people didn't um, hear the video. And we just want to clarify um, that for those people who are on the phone, you'll need to mute your phone and turn on your computer speakers, because the videos are coming through the, through the computer. Um, and if you're not seeing the video or hearing it, it may be an issue of bandwidth. Um, and we apologize for that. But again, this webinar will be recorded, and you'll be able to go back and look. And as Linda mentioned there also are um, links online. Uh, so sorry, Linda, to interrupt you, but um, I'll turn it back over to you now. Oh, thank you. I didn't realize that, that, it, that everyone couldn't hear it, that, because that first video would be important to hear. So, um, so I hope everybody can hear this. Moises is, is a really important video to hear. But it's an example of how a t when a teacher and a child do not share the same language, look at what they do. Um, in order to bridge that gap. It's a, um, a, a, like I said, it's from um, Sally Durbin's teaching at the beginning. This one's entitled, The Young Dual Language Learner, Brand New Words. You want to tell us something in Chinese? Yeah. So what are you going to tell me in Chinese? Um, are you getting down? You know, Jenny and I were talking to earlier. What's that? It's a bed. It's a bed? Mm -hmm. Oh. And how do you say sleep? Sui cha. Sui We have to say it slowly so I can learn it. No books. No, I don't know how to say books. Say it slowly. Shu shu. Shu shu. Yeah. Yeah. 
So. So. Oh, thank you for showing me how to say it so slow. Do we have a sense, was everybody able to hear it or not? It, it, yes, we're getting a lot of yeses, so I think we should move forward. Okay, <laughs> because that would be a tragedy. Um, so the little uh, Spanish-English resource teacher, Moises, did not speak Mandarin. And the, that was an example of how the children could teach him. And if you could see, one, I, mean, I think the, the last one who actually showed him how to form his mouth, which is exactly where dual language learners look when they're trying very hard to understand what you're saying. They will look at your mouth. And so she had him form his mouth in a certain way and then even touch his vocal cords because the sounds coming out might be different when you're speaking Sp Mandarin rather than Spanish or English. But it's a lovely little example of how you can throughout the day incorporate um, interactions, high-level language interactions between you and children who you don't even understand their language. Um, hopefully he learned how to say the word book. <laughs> okay, so the next one is from a transitional kindergarten. Barbara Blakely is the teacher, and again, it's an example of a language interaction where the teacher is teaching the children a new vocabulary word. going anywhere fast? No. Do we have anything particular we want to do? No. No, we're just cruising along. Okay. The other thing that I think um, this program allowed us to do was just expand on language development. Um, I've had more time to realize that in years past you had so much to get through that you just pushed on and, and you take okay. for granted that some vocabulary fast. children understand because they see the con it, it in the context of the story or the book. That's not true. Sometimes you just need explicit teaching of certain vocabulary words. Okay, so, so in that video, it was kind of flipped. The teacher was teaching the children the new vocabulary around cruising because they were, that was part of the theme of the day. Um, and she was doing it in a whole body sort of way, and the children had an opportunity to act out what cruising might, might look like. And they used that throughout the day if you had a chance to see the whole video. So it was, again, a nice example of how a teacher is explicitly um, um, teaching a new vocabulary word to children and using multiple methods to be able to do that. OK, so at this point, I need to stop and see if there are any specific questions on what you've just seen and heard, hopefully heard. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Linda. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. Uh, we definitely won't have time to get through all of them, but I'm going to um, hopefully we can do two. I want to make sure that we move on and, and get the second part of this presentation as well. Um, so the very first question came from Amanda Schultz, and um, that was back at the beginning of your presentation, asking whether there are more uh, sources about uh, number four on your list, which was children need language exposure from competent speakers of that language the importance of good language role models. And the question is, um, how can exposure to a poor language speaker be detrimental to the native language? If you could just talk more about that. Right. So the, the studies that have been done on that topic have typically been done in families or in settings where the children have very poor language models and let's say that the program is in predominantly English. So what the children are learning are pro poor grammatical structures, poor pronunciations, and they're not really developing the metalinguistic awareness of um, how two different languages function. So they may not be, for instance, if the English language model is a native Spanish speaker, and the native Spanish speaker has, and, and I don't think accent is as much of a difficulty as just incorrect grammar, incorrect usage of the language, then the native Spanish speaker is, is not learning English at the higher levels that they could be learning English. Same thing in the home. If the families in the home are trying to speak English, but they really only know pizza, go for pizza, or something like that, 
and, and they can talk at that extent. They can't really have elaborated conversations because they're trying to use a language that they're really not that proficient in. So if they, they, they now exactly what level that is is to be determined, but that, pe that when you're talking with young children, you have to kind of understand what's correct usage of the language. How do we use the, usually use the language? How can we expand on this? What's a good word that I could use instead of um, big or instead of um, reduce it to small or whatever? So that you, you can flexibly use the language and make sure that child is exposed to that, um, that language. And that, they, because they're so adept at learning, Whatever it is you expose them to, that's what they're going to process as being um, a good expression of that language, and that's what's going to stick, and they're going to start applying it in other places. Okay, great, thanks. So, also, so is this? Go ahead. Me also, there are parts in the report that deal specifically with that, and I could certainly, if the people want to do a follow-up email, I can tell them where to look in the report. Okay, great, great. Um, now, I want to make sure that we have time uh, for the second part of this presentation, so I'm actually going to uh, go back on what I said and move on to the next presentation. And as, as I said, we do have all of the questions pulled out, and whatever questions we don't get to, um, we will we'll, we'll be able to do some follow-up communications um, after this webinar. And, and just continue throwing your questions out there. It's great to see how active the chat is. Um, but let's go ahead and turn and move on to the next section. Um, and I believe I'm turning this over to Whit. Is that right? Yes, you're turning it over to me. And I, Linda has such rich material. I'm so glad that we were able to, to cover all of that. As you probably have figured out, I'm a very fast speaker here. So I apologize to the transcriber who's trying to get it all down. But maybe since our, we're going to try to get it all in, and I'll try to slow down a little. I'm, um, my, my topic is aligning pre-K and K-3 language learning and teaching. And particularly, I'm going to go through those strategies that Linda described that she and her colleagues designed and talk a little bit about that application across the continuum of learning. Linda talked about an anchor text, and so that I'm selected to enhance vocabulary development and read repetitively. So one of the things I want to say about this, you'll see in this case that the, we were talking, we were doing a study on structures. And so all of the slides I'm going to, to, going to show you are focused on that study. But I want to say to all of you that the poll strategies are not a curriculum. And so that what the beauty of it is, as I've worked with several school districts, is that these are strategies that apply to the curriculum you're using. And all of the early childhood curriculums that I work with all have anchor text as part of their curriculum. The one thing I would tell you as you look at your own um, curriculum and look at the text that are used in it, one of the things we have learned as we've tried to be more intentional about vocabulary development is we may have had to slow down the pacing. It was it, for children to have time to dig deeper into those anchor texts. And so that as we're doing that, we've seen that that may be one of the things that we have to do is really think about, OK, what, how long does it take to really begin to learn new vocabulary and children to have experience with this? As you'll see in there, it says read repetitively. And the repetition is one of the really important aspects of the poll strategies. The, the, second, um, the second thing that I, um, I want to talk about is vocabulary development. And um, learning new words can be a challenge. In what ways can we help children make meaning? And so it's being selective and intentional. So in the anchor text, we are not talking about reading a book and then thinking you're going to focus on every vocabulary word in that book. So that we're talking about being selective and intentional. One of the things that, um, that Linda has helped me understand is the importance importance of complex and interesting language. I, I, I look a lot of times at some of these key words that we put up on boards for children to learn, you know, and they're boring. They're just not interesting, especially, you know, in terms of you're talking about acquiring a second language. So I'm talking about interesting, selective, and intentionality there. And then the idea that repetition is the key, that opportunities to do that over and over, and that words represent concepts. And so this is one of the things, I, this, these last two bullets I think are really important that have helped me a lot. And what is easier is when we are introducing a new word and it's a known concept to a child. So there's a foundation for what that word is. What is harder is 
when it's a new word and it's a new concept to a child. So that is where assessment is extremely important. <clears throat> we need to figure out what is known by the child, and so the acquisition of the new language on top of that to a new concept, I mean to an old concept, is much easier than when we're talking about learning a new word and a new concept simultaneously. So I'm going to do some of the examples there. So again, in terms of our, um, our example was we were talking about about structures, so we have blocks, building, enormous, massive, tower, construct, tall, sturdy, all these things that could go into structures. And then talking about vocabulary learning as being incremental, it doesn't happen all at once. So in this chart, which may be helpful to you after we finish the webinar, first of all, it's the, the word introduction, and then it's bringing some meaning to that word. Here you see a structure is something that we build. But then more important is we need to have lots of examples and lots of pictorial representations. So it's not just telling children the meaning of the word, but it's giving many examples and lots of pictorial examples. And then what we're doing is physical demonstration. So opportunities, we, we've talked a lot about in early childhood, if it's not in the hand, it's not in the brain. So when we introduce new vocabulary, it's extremely important that children have opportunities to touch and feel and manipulate objects that relate to that vocabulary. And then repetition, so that we revisit this over and over and over again. Now, in terms of the poll strategies, one of the most important elements is what we call these intentional messages. And they are embedded with content vocabulary. And so that they really precede each of our activities or lessons. So the one you see here is, today we are going to observe and build a structure. So that we go over with the children. The children are part of that. They know that that's what we're about to do. And so you see three really important key vocabulary words in here, observe, build, and structure. Not necessarily simple short words, but important words that have meaning to kids. And then. Linda mentioned the importance of um, songs and chants. And this has been a, an unbelievable learning on my part since I have worked with Dr. Espinosa. I have done songs and chants my entire career in early childhood, which is over 40 years. I did not understand the importance of academic and content vocabulary built into those songs and chants until I started working with the poll strategies. So, it's, so we really are being very intentional about saying what is the key vocabulary, what is the intentional message that we're going to be using, and how are we going to develop songs and chants that will reinforce that intentional message. So I know that I'm by myself here and you're all out there, but I hope at your computers you'll sing along with me as we do a couple of examples of songs and chants that we created to go along with the structure theme. So here it goes. And this is to the ABC song. It goes, build a structure very tall, build it strong so it won't fall. Build it strong right at the base, add more blocks, it needs more space. Build a structure very tall, build it strong so it won't fall. So what you see in there, you see that key vocabulary, you see a lot of repetition of the vocabulary in it. And as you'll see, this was a developed, this is saying that we can create our own songs and chants. We are not dependent upon a record or dependent upon a music book. We can take sort of known tunes to children and build our own content-rich and academic-rich songs around it. Here's one other one, and this is if you're happy and you know it. It says, if you think you can build it, then you can. What a structure. If you think you can build it, then you can. What a structure. You can stack the blocks up high. It will almost touch the sky. If you think you can build it, then you can. What a structure. Now, Linda mentioned about um, we've always felt this was important. And there are new studies coming, coming out of the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington that are actually showing in the brain the power of music. And so when we talk about embedding new language and learning new language, connecting that new vocabulary to songs and chants actually is a really important way of building that and embedding that in the child's brain. 
And then we talked about using visual cues, gestures, and enhanced vocabulary development. You saw that in Barbara's video when she was talking about cruising. And what was interesting, if you were in the classroom, you would see children doing that out on the playground. You would see that in the block corner, in the dramatic play corner. They'd be cruising in there, and they would be doing that hand motion to, um, to cruise that. Linda mentioned the concept of total physical response, which a lot of us that have been in the field have studied. And we're really thinking about this in a very targeted and intentional way around vocabulary development. And I want to go through some of the environmental supports as well. And that one of the things I'm hoping you're seeing as I'm talking here is all of these strategies can be applied across age groups. We've talked about with infants and toddlers that we, we may not always be talking about anchor text, it may be anchor experiences. I'm going to give a very, a very clear example. We've talked about the changing table in an infant program. That's a very common experience for young children. How do we create vocabulary? How do we create intentional messaging? How do we create songs and chants around that sort of, that sort of very focused activity. So it is not always a written message, but we can move ahead. I can also see for second and third graders, we're talking about text. It may be more complex text. It may be involving more vocabulary. But the idea of building that vocabulary from that text through intentional messaging and songs and chants holds true for a third grader as well as it does for a preschooler. So in terms of environmental supports, that um, one of the things that's really important is when we talk about the what, it's creating culturally and emotionally supportive climates. So we're, we've talked a lot about literacy and about vocabulary. One of the real goals in your environment is a sense of safety and belongingness. So that as you're thinking about that, it's not always about academics. It's about how that child feels and how that family feels in that environment. So we have many examples of things that you can bring in, sort of, sort of cultural regalia. And and what it, that you could say, this is a place where you belong. And this is one of the issues where the Family Languages and Interest Survey, you can engage families in being part of creating that kind of an environment, asking them to help you create an environment that feels culturally and emotionally supportive. Next, it has to do with scaffolding supports for DLLs. One of the most exciting things to me about poll, as you listen to what poll is, I think it's very concrete scaffolding. We talk about scaffolding a lot in early childhood, but frequently we don't give teachers concrete examples of what that means. And so I think in poll we're being very concrete about scaffolding so that we have issues around labeling. And so there's ways that we can label things in both English and home languages. We start again with physical items, what I said in terms of being in the hand and in the brain, things that children are going to be able to sort of see and touch and feel. And then this at last issue is really important when there are multiple languages, and that is color coding. That in, in Fresno, where I'm working now, we have many Hmong speakers and many Spanish speakers. So actually to use color coding so that you see it label in Hmong, and you see it label in Spanish, and you see it label in English in different languages. I've also seen that in terms of some of our centers, or even in parent notes or whatever, they've been able to use the multiple languages so that families see their language, but they also come to appreciate their other families and different languages that are receiving the message. And then the daily schedule. And so I'm sure that all of you have thought about the daily schedule, but we see as we're working in the poll strategies how important this becomes. And so that when we talk about the, the the core messages, the intentional messages. We talk about the main activities of the day. We're talking about text and home language and English. We're using both words and pictures, especially true in our infants and toddler programs, so that we're beginning to bring the match between the printed word and the actual activity, and that we're looking at the times for language of focus so that people see what we're doing throughout the day. And we also use it to describe what is happening. It helps the children follow along, but it also helps families and visitors understand what we're trying to do in the classroom. We find this is really true with our daily schedule. It's also very true with the intentional message. When families or visitors come in and they see the intentional message right up there, it helps them understand what's going on and what they might want to talk about with the children. And then I ha we have a video here. Again, we're going to go back to Barbara's classroom that's going to show some of the ways that she's been implementing the poll strategies. Went too far there. Oh. 
ways that, that I try to support children's home language when I don't speak their language. And I would say one of the things that here at my school, we have 26 different languages spoken at home here at our school. Hooray, everybody, how are you? How are you? How are you? Hooray, everybody, how are you? But one of the things that we do here is we have just simple, as simple as a good morning song, a hello song, and we try to make sure that we say hello in all the different languages that represent all the children in the class and then other countries that, that are uh, major countries in the world. Okay, are we back to the slides? There we go. And then finally, a lot of the, um, the videos we've been showing you have really been from what we call the transitional kindergarten class. That's Barbara's class, is children that are between preschool and kindergarten. So this is a, a sheet that we're not going to have time to do it now, but I'd like you to take a look at afterwards, and that is to think about some of these strategies, some of the specific examples we've shown you, and think about how you might adapt them in your program for younger children, but also how you might adapt them for older children. As I said, this isn't a curriculum. It's strategies, it's scaffolding strategies that you can use and begin to look at that whole sort of developmental continuum of learning around dual language learners, and think about how some of these strategies can be personalized and individualized to work with the whole age range. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Whit. Um, we have a number of questions um, that are coming into the chat that, um, and I think we, we will have time for um, multiple questions because we got back on track a little bit. Um, in terms of um, what happens if you have a classroom who, with children in preschool who speak, you know, anywhere between three and um, 100 and, or, you know, a preschool with children from many different languages, from three to 126, as we know you've had? Linda or me, I'm fine. I'm, I'm happy to go with that. And that is the case in most of our classrooms. And so, I think as you look at the poll strategies, that it is that we're, we're talking about two things. We are talking about good English language development strategies that are particularly focused on children who are learning a second language, and so that that may be used for all the children in the in the classroom in terms of all 26 languages. At Barbara's school, they do have 26 languages. But the second aspect of supporting home language in terms of using families, using the, the community, honoring the home language, one of the things that we've learned is that um, so in that conversation with families, if it's a, if it's a very low incidence language, in that conversation with family to stress the importance of building that home language so that instead of giving the message to them that we want you to originally to really work on learning English in the home to say we really do want to support that home language. We want you to figure out multiple opportunities for your children to be exposed to the beauty and the complexity of your home language. So it has to do with both, both the fact of trying to bring home language support into the classroom, to bring an environment that exposes children to home language, to try as best you can to bring support in that's directly given it, but also to look at multiple aspects in the community where that home language can be supported and valued. That's helpful, Whit. Thank you. What about, um, could you speak to the issue of young dual language learners in preschool who may have disabilities, learning disabilities? I know this is a very complex topic. Linda, I know that's mentioned in the national report. You want to say something about that? Is Linda with us? Oh, maybe she's muted. Can you hear me? Now yeah. we can hear you. OK, great. Thanks. Um, one of the, a little bit of background. In California and the rest of the state, children in the ages of 
birth to five tend to be less referred and identified as needing special services. So they are under identified, particularly in the birth to three arena. And I think this is really because um, early childhood educators are reluctant to say there's a there's an impairment or a delay or a disability and more eager to say it's a it's a byproduct of learning two languages, which it may or may not be. So and we haven't had really good assessment methods to determine is this a typically developing child who is learning through two languages or is this a child who does have some kind of language impairment and needs intervention? So it now, that reverses itself at K-12, and K-12 children who are EL tend to be over-identified by about first and second grade for um, remedial classes and um, special education. So early on, um, we actually um, wrote a paper about how would you make some distinctions between, is this a typically developing dual language learner, and perhaps there's a period of time when this assessment was taken when the child had recently been exposed to English, let's say, and his first language had started to stall a little bit, so the child might look a little low in both languages, which is actually very normal. That's a very typical process that dual language learners go through. Typically, you know, within time, um, both languages will start to grow and eventually um, the, the capacities in each language will um, become much more age normative. So, so how you would assess and ident or how you would maybe make the first referral, complete a, 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 an evaluation for a child, and then make a decision about whether or not this child does or doesn't have special needs is much more complicated when the child's not a native English speaker. But the one thing that, that I've learned, and I think from when I was working in LAUSD to now even, um, we still have issues around speech language pathologists not understanding that you need to assess both languages. So if a child may look delayed and slow and have articulation problems in English, it really may just be because they've had limited exposure. And if their first language is, is humming along age-appropriate levels, then that child probably does not have a language impairment. Because if you have a language impairment, you have it in both languages. You don't have it in just one language. You'll have it in both languages. And the trajectory for dual language learners does look different than monolinguals. So we have to, in some ways, adapt our expectations based upon what's more normative for children who have more than one language. And, and just one other thing I want to say, and besides, in terms of what Linda was saying is extremely important, there's also been questions about children, for instance, children on the autism spectrum or children with Down syndrome, children with physical disabilities, about their ability in terms of, support, of being supported around the dual language acquisition, that the studies at University of Washington, the studies at San Diego State have shown that those children are very capable of, 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 of functioning in a dual language environment, and so that, so that the message in terms of there's been some messages given to families like we prefer that you speak English at home, we don't want to confuse your child, and the studies have not shown that. The studies have shown for children with those kind of developmental delays that it is that they can function within a dual language environment. That's and such an important, important point. Thank you. Oh, did you. Were you saying something, Linda? I was just going to say that is covered in the report as well. I did want to say that I just wanted to reiterate that um, all of the reports that Witt and Linda are referencing will be shared with you. Um, and in addition, I see that there are a number of questions related to research and citations for research. For example, um, research on how exposure to a poor language speaker can be detrimental to the native language. And similarly, um, citations on that brain research around singing and chanting. Um, and those are just two examples, but we, we will definitely be collecting those citations as well as the reports referenced, and we'll have a resource list that we will be sharing with everyone in addition to the questions that we didn't get to. I think that, do we have time for a few more questions or should we move into our wrap up? Let, let's try and do one more question. Okay.
Elizabeth, are you choosing the question, or are you on mute? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hold tight, everybody. Elizabeth is choosing the key question to ask. Yes, I know. I know there are a lot. What about, um, what about, could you talk a bit more about the transition, supporting the transition from preschool to the kindergarten setting? Can I give you an example of something that we've just, I mean, it's been so exciting to us, is that um, in terms of the communication between pre-K and K, one of, the, um, one of the things that we're starting to do is really begin to talk about, OK, songs and chants and anchor texts and what, to, to really pass those on. I mean, it is a fact that you know we, we actually we start from point one at the beginning of kindergarten. A lot of the children have not had any development. So the more information we can give about what's worked and where kids are and what vocabulary and what language has been helpful to them, and I know in certain environments that's easier than in others, but we're really beginning to stress having particular articulation about language development so that we're not, you know, there's usually there's articulation between preschool and K, but to really focus on dual language acquisition and, and, the, and the vocabulary and the language as children are developing. Linda. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that I would say is that as districts look at their um, identification procedures at kindergarten and design educational pro approaches with different language models, say K-3, I think they need to consider the, what the children come in with. Yeah. So because for a long time, children, kindergarten may have been their first exposure to real school and their first exposure to anything like intentional English. Um, these children in Fresno will have had years of bilingual exposure and high quality bilingual exposure. So they will come in with, and this is our hope, <laughs> we'll, the children are being assessed, um, that they will have language proficiencies in English and in their home language, and they will be prepared to enter into different types of programs. So, so, so school districts may have designed approaches based upon an old K-12 model. Let me put it that way, um, where, you, where you restrict amount of exposure to English in the first years of schooling, um, under the understanding that children didn't have much capacity to understand, and to comprehend, and participate in English language lessons. They may, that may no longer be true. And so I think it's going to be very important for districts to look at, you know, what are the language proficiencies of these children coming in? What have been their prior experiences? And how are they doing in some of these early um, literacy tasks in both of their languages? Because, because they may want to rethink, you know, language models. Great, thank you. Um, and this is Carrie. I'm just going to jump in for a minute. Um, there's another question that's that's just come up that I think is a good uh, a good follow up to the to the one you just answered. Um, that is thinking about ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act. How are people meeting the requirements in terms of pre-K? And have uh, Linda, have you and Wit um, been dealing with that at all? You know, well, you know one thing. Can I just back up a second? Because when Linda was talking, something really hit me. And that has to do with knowledge. That, and what we discovered was that most of our, most of our pre-K people were not aware of what was going on around language acquisition and language programs at the K-12 level. And most of our K-12 people were not aware of what was happening. So that, we be, so that collaboration and knowledge about programs, I mean, it's like, so how do we begin to help people understand, you know, it's not, it's not just about the child but about the program continuum as well. Linda, Essa, you want to say something? Right. Well, so Essa is um, encouraging more collaboration between um, K-12 and pre-K, so that in their plans, in their state plans, they actually have to talk about how they are coordinating with early childhood and how they are working with families to a much greater extent than they had before. So I think all of this is good. Um, the extent to which districts are implementing that and how they're doing it, I think it's a little too early to tell right now, quite frankly. Um, one of the other um, features of ESSA is that the accountability for outcomes for um, dual language or English language learners is residing much more at the school and um, program levels, or school site and classroom level. 
Um, so schools um, are uh, have the flexibility to design assessment approaches depending upon their population. Whether so, the regulations have loosened up somewhat around accountability. Other than identification, states have, a, have to have a, a consistent approach for identifying ELs at K. Um, now, how this is being played out, what has this meant for district-level and state-level policies around ELLs, um, I think it's, it's early and, and it's hard to tell. But I think one thing in California is that um, the state has recognized the really high priority that needs to be given to dual language learners from a very early age from birth. And so we've seen a lot of activity. I mean, really and truly, it's been remarkable how much attention and funding has been right. um, made available to programs. And that, I'm afraid I, I think that is true, and I, I feel very hopeful about that, too. I'm afraid we're going to have to end on that hopeful note, though. <laughs> Um, we have we have run out of time, um, and I think we should have another web webinar to keep talking about these topics. Um, but I do need so I do need to close up this one. But um, I do want to reiterate that we will be collecting these um, resources for you, including research citations, because that is something that the REL the REL program offers as a service as well, in addition to um, other answers to other questions. And as we mentioned earlier, this webinar will be archived and uploaded, so you will have it. And I love the idea that many people have brought up that um, you can share this freely with your colleagues. We would love that. And so as long as you register for today's webinar, you'll receive an email from us with these follow-up items. And also, um, you can download the files that we did make available today from the download pod. And um, we do have a survey that we would be most grateful if you would take, um, because that way we can learn what worked, um, what worked, and suggestions that you may have for us. Um, so um, it would really be great if you could take the time for a survey. But thank you all so very much for joining us. And most of all, thank you to Linda and to Witt for a wonderful presentation with such concrete examples of strategies to take away and use in your classrooms and programs. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Sure. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.